same sentence that they did the person who was selling the drug. That's the federal drug law. It's called conspiracy. You mamas, they can put you in jail. They just show mercy sometimes, but they're getting ready to stop showing mercy. If your son or daughter is selling drugs out of your house, the federal government can come in, seize your house, put you out, try you in federal court, and send you to penitentiary if they want to, and you never touch the drug. That's the law. It's called conspiracy. If I knew, or if I should have known, then I can be charged with the same crime and get the same sentence. And that's one of the reasons that females, African-American females, 18 to 28, is currently the fastest growing prison population in the United States of America. Right. It's time to wise up. It's time for everybody to wise up and let's stop being blind like we don't know. If you got to be by yourself, you got to be ready to be by yourself. That's just the way it's got to be. You'd rather be by yourself than be in prison somewhere or find yourself in a, a tough situation where you get hurt or your children get hurt because people want to do crazy things with crazy people that would shoot people for no other reason than they didn't pay me what they were supposed to pay me. Now, I'm not exaggerating because I'm not a person given to hyperbole. I deal with this almost every week. Almost every week. This is real. This is the truth. This is the reality of what we're up against and what we're dealing with. And many people don't get it. See, that's why my fight is so intense to try to win children in this community, and particularly young boys, because if we don't win them, ultimately they pull the women into their nonsense. And at best, the women are left with the children after they get killed or go to penitentiary. At best, that's the best that happens. That's the best outcome that we end up with. So if at some point we don't break the cycle and win enough boys and young girls to a compelling vision to really serve God, that we raise up a critical mass that is substantial enough that we can turn the tide and tip the scale in the direction of civility and a restitution of a sense of community. Look, this ain't no game. This literally is spiritual warfare that we're engaged in, and the prize is our next generation. And right now, we're losing. Big time. We're not winning. As a matter of fact, we're not even competitive in the game right now. <laughs> so Jesus turns to them and says, look, y'all crying for me? You better cry for yourself. You better cry for yourself. And if the direction we're going as a community, we better start weeping for ourselves at how bad things can get. Well, the next cast of characters are introduced in verse 32. There were also up two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, they, there they crucified him, Jesus, and the criminals on the right hand and the other on the left. Now Luke doesn't go into the gory details about the crucifixion. The people who were writing to would have been very familiar with how horrific and how barbaric crucifixion was. And Luke says that's really irrelevant. The fact that they were crucified, the Son of God, is bad enough without you having to know all the gory, bloody, sadistic details. So Luke said that they just crucified him. Jesus in the middle, two thieves, one on the right and the other on the left. But Luke adds something interesting. Luke says, and in the, the Greek text of verse 34, it is what is in a progressive tense. It's that he said something in the past, but he kept on saying it. So he didn't just say it one time. So Luke says, while they were crucifying him, while they were nailing his wrists to the cross beam, while they were nailing his feet uh, to the vertical post, while they were hoisting him up in the air to put him on the vertical piece, Luke says Jesus continued to say repeatedly over and over again, verse 34, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. He doesn't say how many times he said it. He just said he said it over and over and over and over again. Now, this is an interesting passage here because what? Jesus was not saying, he was not asking for a blank forgiveness 
for everybody that was there. He wasn't asking for a blank forgiveness for everybody involved in this crucifixion. This was a specific request he's making to the Father for some specific people for a specific thing. And here's what he was saying. What he was saying is, Father, these men have a lot of sins on their account since they were kids. And added to all the sins they already have, there's one more sin that they are now committing. They are crucifying me, their only hope of salvation. They are nailing me to the cross. So, Father, forgive them for crucifying me. That's what the request was. Forgive them for crucifying me because if you don't forgive them for crucifying me, then they can never possibly be saved. So Jesus was leaving the door open for salvation of his crucifiers. This is powerful. Yeah. This is powerful. What he was saying, if you don't forgive them of this, they will be burdened down with so much guilt and so much shame. And the reason he kept saying it repeatedly, because he wanted them to hear it. He wanted them to hear him pray to his father, asking his father to forgive them. So if sometime in the future they repented, they would remember when Jesus asked that the father would forgive us for crucifying him. So there's hope for us. That's the Christ that we serve. The Christ that we serve is that as long as blood is running warm in a person's vein, there's hope for them. And that's why every week when we leave this place and go back to our homes, our communities, and our jobs, we should be praying and asking the Lord to bring us into contact with someone that we can let them know God loves you, he's concerned about you, there's hope for you. Regardless of the situation or the circumstance, the God that I know and serve is magnanimous. He is philanthropic. He is filled with love and forgiveness for whoever will repent and call upon his name. That's what this text is. So he says it over and over again so that those who are driving the nails in his hands and in his feet and the one who would drive a spear through his side, that if they ever came to themselves, they would hear and remember his voice praying to the Father that they might have forgiveness. It is the greatest need of our society. It is the second most two powerful words in the entire vocabulary, I personally believe. I think the first and the most powerful words in vocabulary is I will. Because our will activates me, my person, my skills, my talent, my power, my passion. It activates you when you say, I will do something. And so activating our will then activates the Holy Spirit to work in and through us to enable us to get it done. But the Holy Spirit is not going to go against what we will to do. I believe I will are the two most powerful words in the language. I believe the next three most powerful words are these. I forgive you. I believe the, the three next most powerful words in any language. I forgive you. Because there is a double consequence when I say I forgive you. First of all, I'm confronting the sin in my own heart, recognizing I needed to be forgiveness, therefore forgiven, and I have received God's forgiveness, therefore I now have the capacity to forgive, so I am free by forgiving. But forgiveness also frees the other person to know that they get a chance to do better, that they can do better. Now, there are some people that have done me tremendous harm. I will never be best friends with them, but I have forgiven. You see, forgiveness does not mean that something didn't happen and that something didn't happen that was bad. But forgiveness says, I am giving up my right to get even with you, and I do not wish you any bad. I do not wish any harm to you. I only wish the best that could ever happen for you because forgiveness says I want to seek your highest good. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't want to hold you back in any way at all. So Jesus, he is liberating these people and they don't even know they've been liberated. They're being set free that someday they might be able to be saved because they will know that the one who has the power to forgive them has already requested the Father forgive them and they still have a chance. I could stay right there, but I won't. All right. Now, on 
on top of that, the double whammy is they nailed him to the cross. He's hanging there. He's asking the Father to forgive them, and at the same time, they're shooting crap on his coat.